ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات ربي وسلام عليه وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اما بعد يقول الله عز وجل في القران الكريم بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون we praise him subhanahu wa ta'ala the king the master the sustainer the creator of the seven heavens and the earth and we send peace and blessings upon his beloved muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam my brothers i remind myself and i remind you as Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us in His holy book, O you who believe, O you who have Iman, have fear of Allah. Have the fear that is most deserving towards Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to not die except in the state of submission, except in the state of Islam. My brothers, this world is a race. This life that you're living now is a race. And the day of judgment will be the end of that race. And on that day, my brothers, you see, there are many names for the day of judgment. And one of the names for the day of judgment is the day of regret. Because it is on that day, my brothers, where people will come to see the reality of things, they will then look back at their lives and then they will start to regret. That where did I go with my life? Where did I invest my time? Where did I invest my money? Where did I invest my health? Did I put it to that which was going to be beneficial for me on that day? Or did I waste it like the millions and millions around the world that also wasted it? This life, my brothers and sisters, Wallahi, believe me when I tell you, don't be fooled with what's happening around you. It's a race. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He used to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He orders the believers and race and hasten to that which is good. Compete amongst one another. We should be competing amongst one another to that which is good and to that which is khair. Why? Because when this race is over and each person will be given his reward, there's no coming back. You see, it's not like here now in dunya, you and I, we can do an exam. And maybe, you know, you didn't do very well in it. So you go back to the college or to the school or whatever the case is. Yeah, you reapply and you come back and you may sit that subject again and you could sit the exam again. But with Allah, there's no such thing. My brothers, we only have one life. There's no second chance. There's no second shot. And Wallahi, my brothers, you know, I mention as much as I can, but over the last week I've seen some amazing things. Nothing new really. But I thank Allah that it still affects me. Yani, wallahi, I really thank Allah that it still has the effect on my heart. You know, we've buried maybe three, four brothers over the last week alone. Young brothers. Young shabab in the peak of their lives, still in their fruitful ages. And look, wallahi, I find this amazing. Because we know the month of Ramadan is but, you know, some days away. And we, you know, we're usually talking about the month of Ramadan and in preparation for the month of Ramadan. And I'm sure you're going to hear it. Those who live to see Ramadan, wallahi, it's a ni'mah from Allah. Wallahi, it's a ni'mah. It's a gift. Don't think that you living to see Ramadan is because of days, days followed, nights. No, it's a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. So for the last week, you know, we've buried whatever it was, three or four. One brother was 16 years of age, 16 years of age, perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, was living his life, had hopes, dreams, ambitions. Yet Allah cut that short for him. 
he was days, he was really, he was days. Honestly, he was hours away from the greatest month that will ever hit your life. The greatest month of the year is the month of Ramadan. He really, he could smell it. He was there, he was almost, you could see it with your eyes. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cut his life short and took him away. Another brother was 26, 26 years old, father of, I can't remember, two or three. Allah took him away. When is my time? Really, in truth, when is my time? My brothers, wallahi, we're living in this world like I have a long time. Brother, you have nothing. Your asal is death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he spoke about the creation, he says, verily we created death. Then, whoa, whoa, then we created life. Allah, one could argue logic, brother, but surely there has to be life first. Then we can talk about death. Allah says, no. He says, we created death. Your beginning was death. Then we gave you life. And your life was only for a very short time. Iyam, ma'dudat, counted days. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a very interesting conversation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks to those people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to those people who when they stand before Him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, and how long did you live on dunya? How long? How long did you roam the streets for? 50 years? 60 years? Ya you live to see 100? They said, Yawman, oh, ba'd a yawm. Oh, Allah, a day, maybe half a day at most. Don't be fooled with your. Tab, I want to ask, how did you live this half a day of yours? How? And how will you go? Because, my brothers, let me tell you something also, you know. In Islam, there's no such thing as coincidence. This concept of coincidence, accident, this is un-Islamic. In fact, it goes against the aqidah of a Muslim. Because as a believer, you and I both know that whatever happens to your life, whatever happens to an individual, was a decree. It was a de Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed it. And there is nothing in the world that was ever going to change it. You know, my brothers, some of us, when we hear news, like this young boy, you know, 16 years old, what a tragic accident. And wallahi, يعني, I'm not having, I'm talking about the scenario. What a tragic accident. As a believer, what was tragic about it? He died exactly where Allah destined him to be. In the way that Allah destined him to die in. Sometimes, you know, and we hear this again. Many brothers in the area, and unfortunately, this has become a common thing. Well, someone got shot the other night, but it was an accident. We, we weren't intending him. Brother, there are no accidents. That bullet that took his life had his name on it. But my question to you is, my brother, honestly, how will you go? How will you leave this dunya? In what state will you be in? You see, my brothers, because when Allah takes your life, it's not a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took your life at a calculated time. But the question now here for you and I is, how will I go? How many brothers have left without salah in their life? How many brothers have left with no Quran in their lives? How many? becoming more and more apparent. You know what, my brothers, I want to share something with you. Wallahi, this is very deep, so please give me your hearts. One of the scholars, he's speaking and he's mentioning something that I found extremely interesting. And he poses this, so think with me. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king, the malik, the creator of the seven heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala claims that he is the greatest. Yes or no? Of course, subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is. And he claims to be the most forgiving, the most loving, 
the most just, yes or no? Of course, subhanahu wa ta'ala claims and we've accepted those claims and we believe those claims. So now the scholar is asking, and please look how deep this is. So now the scholar says, well, okay, fine. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king, the most loving, the most forgiving, the most compassionate, the most just, why does Allah, when a kafir, when a disbeliever, when a non-Muslim, whatever you like, when a kafir who denies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why does Allah cast this person into hellfire for eternity? Really, if we're going to think with logic and reason, the man disbelieved in you, O oh Allah, for 60 years. Let's say he died at 60. Did Allah throw him in hellfire for 60 years? Fine, the punishment, you know, his crime was so great, double his punishment, give him 120. But why are you casting him into hellfire for eternity? It's interesting, isn't it? And the opposite is true. Ya Allah, this person was a believer for 50, 60 years, he prayed, he worshipped you for 50, 60 years. Fine. Reward him with Jannah for 50, 60 years. Double it. Give him 100 years of Jannah for his 50 years of living and, you know, and Ibadah. But oh Allah, why are you giving him eternal Jannah? So the scholar makes an interesting point. And Wallahi, for those who have hearts will understand that these words are very, very heavy. He says, because when Allah took the life of the kafir, He took it at such a moment in his life that had this person lived for eternity, he was going to always live on kufr. And when Allah took the life of the believer, He took his life at such a point in time that had this Muslim lived for eternity, he was going to always live with Iman in his heart. That's why Allah gives him eternal Jannah. And that's why Allah Azza gave this person eternal punishment in hellfire. So my question to you today is, if you and I die today, which is a very real reality, regardless of what your heart tells you, if you and I die today without Salah, what does this say in the books of Allah? You know what that says, my brother? That has you lived for eternity, you were never going to pray. And that if you died without Quran in your life, if you and I died today without Quran in my life, you know what that means? It means you were never going to read Quran. So don't kid yourself. And wallahi, my brothers, again, we need to come back. How am I living my life? Where am I going with my life? And how will I live? And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes my soul, in what condition will it be in? What condition will it be in? Is it a tas really, is it a soul that Allah is pleased with? Is it a soul that the angels are pleased with? Or am I going to be a soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with? Ask yourself these things, my brothers. Wallahi. And honestly, for your sake, for your deen, for your iman, wallahi, I beg you. You know what? I don't. I challenge you. How's this? I challenge you to go to the cemetery and just walk. Walk and read these tombstones. Walk and read their ages. Walk and read their dates. What has made us believe? What has convinced? What has fooled us, my brothers, that we're going to live for a long time? Wallahi, my brothers, this life is very real. More real than you will ever know. And you won't understand how real this life is until you stand by Wallahi, until you die. Only then will you come to understand woe. Woe to me. Now, my brothers, again, I'm sharing personal experiences because there's times, you know, when you mention stories of Sahaba, and they say, oh, come on, man, we, you know, these people were very special. I'm telling you today, today, wallahi, my brothers, I had a very close friend of mine call me just the other day, just the other day. 
He says to me, my first cousin, 40 something, he's 40 something years old. Never prayed in his life. Never fasted in his life. No deen, no nothing in his life. But like every single one of us, and no one is safe from this, you know. No one is safe from this. But like every single one of us, brother, alhamdulillah, man, I have a good heart. I don't harm anyone. Yeah, look, you know what? Sure, there's a few shortcomings in my life. But overall, Allah, and look, Allah knows what's in my heart. True or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in my heart. Forty something years age, of age, right? Wakes up in the morning, what was supposed to be a numb hand, goes to the doctor for a blood test, comes back home after a scan. Wallahi, he said to me, before he even made it home, the doctor calls him and says to him, come straight back. You have a tumor in your brain that's cancerous. My brothers, you have no idea how many of these examples, they're surrounding us here in this area. My brothers, what am I trying to highlight with this story? Really, my brothers, if we're not waking up now, when are we ever going to wake up? If this month of Ramadan that is only but a few days away, if this month of Ramadan doesn't change your life, really, I'm honestly concerned for the both of us. When are we going to wake up? When are you and I going to wake up as believers and start to take life seriously? So the brothers come to him and naturally, you know, as wallahi, as anyone would. Ya akhi, you need to pull up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done to you. Don't worry about your past. Pray, repent, turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, no, 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 no. And came up with every excuse in the world as to why he's not where he's supposed to be. And refused. Refused to repent. Not so much in his words as in no, I will not. But he just wouldn't do it. You know what happened three days later, my brothers? Allah took his speech away from him. Now he can't talk. The man can't talk. And I think Allah, he's still alive. It's not for me to judge. I mean, if the man's repenting in his heart, well, then this is great for him. But Allah, my brothers, this for me, sharing this story is not about him. I'm not concerned about him. I'm concerned about me. I think, oh Allah, how will I leave this world? In what condition will I leave? Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took His ability to speak. He took it. Why? Because Allah gave you a ni'mah, Allah gave you a blessing, and you didn't use it for what it was intended for. So, my brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you this beautiful life so you can make use of it, and you don't use it for what it's intended for, then Allah can take it anytime He wants. Allah, he can take it any time he wants. He took his ability to speak. Allahu Akbar. My brothers, you know, we're, we're, we're what? We're, we're like less than two weeks, yeah? Less than two weeks away from the greatest month of the year. I want to ask you, Wallahi sincerely, what have you prepared for it? What are your aims? What are your goals? What is it that you want out of the month of Ramadan? Have you made genuine intentions to change? Have you made genuine intentions to pull up? Because Wallahi, my brothers, what I see happening around us, nothing has been, wallahi, nothing is sacred anymore, nothing. Even the month of Ramadan that used to be, you know, for me, I remember the month of Ramadan, the one that had a girlfriend before the month of Ramadan, he used to call up his missus and tell her, listen, man, <laughs> look, uh, the month of Ramadan is a couple of days away, uh, so inshallah ta'ala, we can't talk in this month, right? So I'll have to see you directly after the month of Ramadan. 
Wallahi, I remember boys, I used to have pizza. I used to tell them, listen, man, this is all I've got left. I'm going to sell what I have left. <laughs> and we will return to business after Ramadan. And we used to mock that back then. But now even that's gone. Wallahi, even that, even that sort of love for the month of Ramadan, that inspiration to at least want to be good in the month of Ramadan, Wallahi, even that's gone. And my brothers, Wallahi, we have all been fooled. Because to you and I now, and this is what's happening culturally, culturally, what's really for you and I, what has the month of Ramadan become? It's become a festive month. It's become a month of celebration, a month of feasts, a month of hulu. And I'm not saying these things are haram. Please, I don't want anyone to, brother, what are you, what are you, you know, are you saying this? No, 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 it's halal. But look how we've been fooled. This month of ibadah, this month of Quran, this month of tawheed, this month of repentance, of coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the month I recalibrate my compass. This is the month you do your will alignments. Why? Because uh, 11 months of the year I've been out of whack. But now this great month that is supposed to be the month of calibration, what's it become? It's no longer calibrating, it's now just plain celebrating. Massive feasts and massive dinners and wallah you're going to come over and if you don't come over I'm going to get upset. And it's hanging out now until 2-3 o'clock in the morning. And camel burgers, yeah, Allah camel, I, I, I don't understand. You know which animal hates the month of Ramadan like no other? Camels. He's thinking, man, what's this got to do with me? Camel burgers, and well, is it haram? Really, is it haram? No, no. But is this what the month is about? Is it about celebration and camel burgers and cocktails until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning? Is it about hanging out with the boys until, you know, no, my brothers, wallahi, don't be fooled. <coughs> and you know what my dalil is to the fact that the month of Ramadan is not a month of celebrations? Because if it was a month of celebration, look, because look how it gets disguised. You know, brother, so what's wrong with it? Alhamdulillah, people are getting together and having a good time. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I love the fact that Muslims are coming together and they're happy and there's love and there's peace between us. Wallahi, I love that. But that's not the month for it. It's not the purpose. Why? Because now when the month becomes this, coming back to what my dalil is, then what's the point of Eid? What's the point of Eid? If we're having big feasts and massive hangouts all every night of the month, What's the point of Eid? No. The point of Eid is because those who were smart enough, those that were wise enough, those that were eager enough, those that invested their time in the month of Ramadan, then after the month, Allah says, now stop what you're doing. Today is the day of celebration. Today is the day you people come together and you feast and you celebrate and you have your sweets and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept, you know, to accept our ibadat. So this is the purpose of Ramadan, my brothers. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nastaghfiru wa nusalli ala al-habib Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My brothers, the month of Ramadan, regardless of what anyone tells you, it's the month of forgiveness. It's the month of Rahmah. It's the month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He orders the gates of the hellfire to be closed and the doors of Jannah to be opened. My brothers, Wallahi, all year round, you know, I can speak about myself because I know myself. All year round I've had shortcomings. This is my opportunity to correct things. This is my opportunity to really make a change. My brothers, did you know that every single night in the month of Ramadan, and wallahi, no matter how many times I mention this, 
every night in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He looks down upon His ummah. And He handpicks those people and He says, You, hellfire has been made haram on you permanently. What an opportunity, man. Wallahi, my brothers, you know, whenever I hear and I read this, I say to myself, where will I be when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking down? How will I be spending my time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking down? Every night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He picks those people. And He says, you, hellfire has been made haram on you. This month, my brothers, is the opportunity for the worst person in the world, the worst, the absolute, the biggest criminal in the world. This is his opportunity to become of the greatest people with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the month where dreams become true. Wallahi they do for those that invest. This is the month that your fathers, your fathers, your forefathers, the Sahaba, they used to prepare for it six, seven months in advance in preparation for this month. And then when the month would come and they would worship Allah, yeah, at the end of the month, they would spend months after begging and crying to Allah, Oh Allah, accept that month that passed us by. The Prophet of Allah, he says, what, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, if the people knew, if the people knew what laid, what lies in the month of Ramadan, they would wish the whole year was Ramadan. What are your goals, my brother? What are your ambitions? Have you put together a schedule? Do you know what you want to do? Allah, my brothers, just very, very quickly, and it's very hard for me to tell what you should and should be doing because brothers are at different levels and many of us have different capabilities. But how many of the five prayers, how many of them do you plan on praying in the masjid in this month? And how much of the nawafil do you plan on praying in the month of Ramadan? For have we forgotten that the Prophet of Allah, he says, there are 12 raka'at, there are 12 raka'at of sunnah, there are 12 raka'at of sunnah in the day. Whoever prays them in the day, sahih hadith, the Prophet of Allah, he says, I promise him a palace in Jannah. 12 raka'at of nafil, sunnah. Whoever prays them in the day, the Prophet of Allah, he says, I promise him a palace in paradise. You know what they are? The two raka'at before Fajr, four raka'at before Duhr, two raka'at after Duhr, two raka'at after Maghrib, and two raka'at after Isha. Twelve. Two before Fajr, four before Duhr, two after Duhr, two after Maghrib, and two after Isha. Prophet of Allah says, whoever prays them in a day, for him is a palace in paradise. Have you set this as a goal? The Prophet of Allah, he says, what, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, whoever prays Fajr in Jama'ah and then sits in the remembrance of Allah until Shuruq and until the sun cracks, the light starts cracking out of the sun, about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 40 minutes after the Adhan of Fajr, give or take. The Prophet of Allah says, whoever prays Fajr in Jama'ah and sits in the remembrance of Allah, good opportunity to read your Quran in the month of Ramadan, he says, until the sun rises, until this time of shuruq, and then this person prays two rak'at. That's all he has to do. Prays two rak'at. The Prophet of Allah, he says, the reward for this person is the reward of hajj and umrah. Tam, tam, tam. He says, full reward, full reward, full reward of a hajj and umrah. How much of this do you plan on doing in the month of Ramadan? How much? Charity, my brothers, the Sahaba said the Prophet of Allah was the most giving person. But in the month of Ramadan, he would give even more. He would give even more in the month of Ramadan. What have you planned for charity in the month of Ramadan? Will you be like everyone else? And you know, as the month comes, he forgets this day, he forgets that day. Or will you be smarter than that and you plan your charity from now? There are many organizations many, many, many organizations, trustworthy organizations, that for 
For $50, they can feed a family of five for the whole month of Ramadan. $50 can feed a family of five people for the whole month of Ramadan. But when do I give my 50? Two days before Eid? No, give it now. Why? So that in the month of Ramadan, every single day you will tick the box of giving charity. Every day I know, khalas, I'm set. Every single day in the month of Ramadan, I've definitely ticked the box of charity. We need to be smart with our time. We need to be smart with our money and do these things now. Don't be like everyone else. Don't be like those people who simply work off hype. First few days of Ramadan comes, Allahu Akbar, move out of the way. Then he sleeps one prayer, sleeps one, you know, one of this, one of that. Slacks off for the whole month. Then on the 27th night, he gets pumped all over again. How many, wallahi, how many Ramadans have you wasted in your life like this? How many? So my brothers, please, wallahi, I'm begging you. Don't be, wallahi, we do not want to be from those people who when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we look at this month and we're in a state of regret. Don't. Make the use of this month, my brothers. Wallahi, make use of it. You know, and I always give this example. Every year I give this example. You know what analogy I give to the month of Ramadan? You see, because we know the value of money. We don't know the value of deen. I want you to imagine, honestly, the local bank here gave you a call. And says to you, brother, look, uh, mashallah, you've been chosen from so many, you know, because we love you. You know, your bid's very nice. It's very straight. And your eyes, they twinkle in the light like this. MashaAllah, uh, we've come together as an organization and we've chosen you amongst everyone. And uh, as a reward for you, as a gift for you, we're going to open up our vaults downstairs. We're going to take you downstairs. We're going to open up our vault. We're going to open up our treasures. And you have two hours in there, sir. Two hours. Do as you please in those two hours. Do as you please. Um, some of you now, even though it's a uh, hypothetical, <laughs> your eyes are glittering. <laughs> Two hours, because give me half an hour, see what I'll do in there. Why? Because I know the value of money. I know what I can do with that money. And in those two hours, honestly, are you going to go there? I'm going to call my uncle, my uncle, my uncle, my uncle, my uncle. Don't come in your car, come in the van. Bring the tarago, bring the you, cause bring whatever you can. Park them all outside, inshallah. Two hours, I'm going to offer my dini faram. Why? Honestly, honestly, in those two hours, will you be checking your Facebook posts? Will you be checking WhatsApp in those two hours? Will you be having a, just, just a quick nap? Wallahi, I've been tired. I was up all night. The wife did my head in. Just let me have a quick nap. Would you be sleeping in those two hours? Huh? Will you have time for knefi and camel burgers in those two hours? No, you won't. Why? Brother, we got to work, man. I only got two hours in here. If I spend these two hours right, what's the expression? If I spend these two hours right, I'll be set for what? Set for life, man. My brother, if you spend your Ramadan correctly, you'll be set for life. But not this life that will end very soon. The real life. And I will end with this, inshallah ta'ala, because... We need to always be balanced between hope and fear. The Prophet of Allah, my brothers, the Prophet of Rahmah and Mercy, in the Sahih Hadith, he stood on the mumbar in front of the Sahaba and he says, May he be disgraced. May his nose be rubbed in the dirt in humiliation. May he be disgraced. May he be disgraced. May he be disgraced. My brothers, you know what happened to Sahaba when they heard the Prophet of Allah speak like this? This is a man who forgave the kuffar of Mecca. He says to all of them, go free. Idhabu fa go, go, every single one of you is free. I forgive every single one of you. 
This is the same man who when the Arab came into the masjid urinating in the corner, he said to the Sahaba, no, 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 leave him, let him finish. This same man is now standing in front of them and he's taking, he's saying, oh Allah, disgrace this person. May he be disgraced. May he be disgraced. May he be disgraced. Sahaba are boggled. A prophet of Allah, who? Who is this wicked person that you're disgracing like this? You know who? He says, the Muslim. The one who Allah allowed him to live to see Ramadan. He lives out the days of Ramadan. But he doesn't have his sins forgiven by the end of it. May this person be disgraced. You know, my brother, sometimes you look at your life and you think, man, how come my life isn't the best? Could it maybe be that I have the curse of the Prophet of Allah on me? Could it be because Ramadan after Ramadan, Ramadan after Ramadan, I'm wasting my time? This is the Ramadan for change, my brothers and sisters, please. Do not be like the rest of people. Wallahi, wake up. Wake up and save yourselves. Wake up and save yourselves and save your families from a raging hellfire. Make the most of this Ramadan. Make this Ramadan the most fruitful. Make this Ramadan the Ramadan of change, not only for ourselves, but bi ta'ala for the whole Ummah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, نسأل الله عز وجل أن يغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء والأموات. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to have mercy upon every single believer. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to guide us onto the right track. We ask Him subhanahu wa taala to not take our souls until He's pleased with it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to guide every single human being onto the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to allow us to live this, to see this blessed month of Ramadan, to make us of those that are successful in the month of Ramadan, to make us of those whom He handpicks and makes the hellfire haram on us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to give victory to the believers wherever they are, wherever they're struggling, wherever they're fighting, wherever they're hungry, wherever they're cold, wherever they're in need. O oh Allah, be with them, help them, aid them, feed them, clothe them, protect them, unite their hearts, unite our hearts. O oh Allah, make us with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Firdaus al-A'la. Wa nusalli ala al-Habib Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Taqaddam, taqaddam.